The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity, Personalizing and Prolonging Care in GIST, Expert Guidance on Integrating New TKI Strategies, featuring Margaret Van Maren, MD, from Fox Chase Cancer Center, Professor Jean-Yves Blé, MD, from Centre Léon Bérard, and Suzanne George, MD, from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash M-E-R 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one-minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Welcome to Personalizing and Prolonging Care in GIST, some expert guidance on integrating new TKI strategies. I'm Margaret Von Maren from Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, and I'm pleased to welcome my colleagues, Professor Jean-Yves Blais from the Centre Léon Bérard in Lyon, France, and Suzanne George from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. So let's start. As many of you know, GIST is the most common GI sarcoma. It arises from the interstitial cells of Cajal or their precursor cells. It comprises a very small minority of all GI tumors, but if you're thinking about sarcomas, it represents 80% of the GI sarcomas. We find it really anywhere along the GI tract, but it is most commonly found in the stomach or small intestine. Patients typically present in their 40s to 60s, and we think that in most studies anyways, men and women develop just at equal frequencies, although a few have suggested maybe slightly more common in men. GIST has an incidence of about 14.5 million annually and a prevalence of 129 per million. At the end of our discussion, we're going to highlight this case again, but I'm just going to go through it with you so you can think about it and have it in mind as you're uh, learning and listening to the information. So this is a typical patient, 64-year-old male, who's been diagnosed with metastatic GIST. His tumor was biopsied and pathology showed that he, it contains an exon KIT11 mutation. He was evaluated by a multidisciplinary care team and they decided that the best first plan was for him to start on imatinib. He did well and tolerated the therapy. However, about two years after starting imatinib, there was some growth in some of his lesions consistent with signs of resistance. So as we move forward, Dr. Blay um, will summarize the current standards of care. Yes, what we are going to discuss in the first masterclass is actually what are the criteria to select a treatment for first-line uh, metastatic setting as it, for this patient. What are the mechanism of uh, uh, re response and resistance and as well as the standard treatment for second and third line, which are going to be discussed. And Dr. George, uh, would you talk about uh, new therapy strategies? Yes, um, you know, as, as you mentioned in the case, um, patients develop resistance to um, the current available kinase inhibitors. And I will look forward in the second master class to talk about new strategies of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, repretinib and avapritinib, both of which have become available this year. We'll also, as we go through these posters, highlight some presentations that uh, have been presented at CTOS earlier today. There were several presentation, oral presentation on papers uh, with, uh, with an uh, update describing the intrapatient dose escalation following disease progression in patients with, uh, with GIST, which is going to be presented by Dr. George. 
Dans un présentation PLX9486 plus sanity enabled phase 1 study presented by the Dr. Trent, and as well as a presentation on the heterogeneity of KIT and PDGF receptor alpha mutations in the Invictus study presented by the Dr. Bauer. And there have been several interesting posters presented at CTOS this year related to GIST. And this includes the clinical benefit of repretinib as an update of the Invictus trial uh, presented by Professor uh, Gelderblum, as well as um, a summary of the repretinib activity across KIT and Peter Jeff receptor alpha mutations by Dr. Shofsky. Um, Dr. Kang will presented a, the phase three Voyager study, which is a randomized study looking at avapritinib versus uh, regorafenib in patients with advanced GIST, as well as an update on cabazantinib in GIST, and a poster summarizing a new compound, DS6157, which is an antibody drug conjugate being evaluated in GIST. In the last part of the educational activity, we will go back to our patient and have some discussions about the care of patients with advanced metastatic GIST. We will look at the efficacy of um, how to integrate fourth line therapy, have discussions about decision-making strategies when disease progression occurs, think about mutation testing and its importance in primary and secondary resistance, talk about the uh, role of new therapies for D842V mutations in PGFR alpha, have a discussion about the management of adverse events with these new agents, and reinforce the importance of multidisciplinary care and patient education. So let me hand it over to Dr. Blay to start the first master class. Jean-Yves? Thank you very much, Dr. Von Meren, and uh, I, I am happy to present the first master class on mapping the GIST pathobiology to advanced clinical landscape. Uh, we will review the current treatment algorithm for the treatment of patients in, uh, in first line and later setting for patients with advanced GIST. Starting maybe with an uh, uh, epidemiological description of these tumors. These are tumors which are affecting men and women uh, about equally. And these are tu tumors which are affecting uh, all ages from uh, 20 uh, to uh, up to 90 with primary locations being mostly gastric, as we can see here on the green bar, followed by small intestine, and more rarely duodenum, rectum, and other sites. Uh, this age distribution and this diversity of location is one of the specificity of GIST. But on top of this uh, heterogeneity in the clinical presentation, there is also an heterogeneity on the signaling pathway, which may involve uh, different types of driver mutations which are mutually exclusive, actually. You may have either a KIT mutation or PDGF receptor alpha mutation, uh, never the two. If you don't have any mutation in one of a GIST tumor, you may have mutations or alteration of expression of one of the SDH uh, gene, which are uh, present in the mitochondria, which are uh, responsible uh, for uh, important uh, biochemical uh, uh, parameters, including the transformation of succinate uh, dehydrogenase. And uh, the absence of the expression of this enzyme promotes the uh, overexpression of F1 alpha, which is by itself responsible for the expression of VGF, VGF receptors, and probably many other growth factors. And if you don't have this uh, different type of mutation, you may also have mutation downstream pathways, which are connected to the KIT and PDGF receptor alpha pathway, typically NF1 loss, activation of FRAS or activation of BRAFs. And these all convert in this sense to the uh, expression of uh, an important transcription factor, ETV1, which is involved and found to be uh, over uh, expressed in a large proportion of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. With this heterogeneity in uh, molecular characteristics, we find also an heterogeneity in the sites of the mutation in the different organs. And we can see, for instance, that uh, gastric GIST are affected more frequently by uh, mutation on PDGF receptor alpha exon 18, while conversely, small bowel GIST are more frequently affected with mutation on exon 9 of the KIT gene. Or the sites of mutation 
are uh, affected by the wide variety of different mutations. Rectal gist, which are presenting, uh, uh, which are rare and presenting often with uh, exon 11 mutation, but also occasionally, occasionally with exon 9 mutation. Interestingly, you, you may find gist without kit and PDGF receptor alpha mutation in uh, gastric lesions, in particular in young age patients, in particular in female patients. So we can see that we have a wide variety of different molecular subtypes of GIST, and there have been some attempts to pro propose molecular epidemiology of these tumors. What is quite clear is that the majority of GIST are affected with KIT mutation or PGGF receptor alpha mutation. And if these two receptor tyrosine kinase are not concerned by the mutation, the majority of GIST will then have a loss of expression of SDH with uh, several different uh, additional subgroups of GIST, which are extremely rare, admittedly. The incidence, as we have already said, is close to uh, 10 to 14 per million per year, probably a bit underestimated because of the existence of what we call micro-GIST and mini-GIST. Uh, we have to remember that the majority of GIST are affected with PDGF receptor alpha and KIT mutation, but there is a, a wide variety of these different wild-type GIST, as we call them, with a wide variety of different multi, uh, mutation affecting different genes and also loss of expression of the SDH. Actually, two groups of tumors are present in this uh, subgroup, those with conserved expression of SDH, rarer, and those with persistent expression of, uh, with, with loss of expression of SDH, which are, which are more frequent, and again affecting uh, often uh, gastric sites and young patients. On top of that, we also have the mini and micro gist, which are quite frequent in the general uh, uh, population if we, we look at uh, autopsy examination. Probably a large proportion of these gastrointestinal stromal tumor are never diagnosed and never present uh, clinical symptoms for the majority of patients. We don't know exactly the proportion of these micro gist and mini gist in the general population, but uh, some reports uh, mention in autopsy series as high as 10 to 20% of the patient affected with these micro gist. Interestingly, they have the same type of mutation than what we have described. What is the ma management of advanced and metastatic GIST? First, we have to distinguish tumors with imatinib sensitive mutation, typically KIT mutation and the sensitive PDGF receptor alpha mutation. In this case, for the majority of tumors, we have to start with imatinib of 400 mg per day. For the exon 9 KIT mutation, we may want to escalate up to 800 mg per day because this is associated with a better progression-free survival. At the time of uh, progression, uh, we will want to evaluate the capacity of surgery to remove a single progressive lesion, for instance. But for the majority of, uh, of cases, we will be not be using surgery and we will be using a next line of treatment, which is in this case sunitinib. At the time of progression after sunitinib, we may be using regorafenib and then, as we are going to see in a few minutes, repretinib. For those imatinib, imatinib non-sensitive mutations, such as PDGF receptor alpha D842V, specific treatment should be proposed given the absence of efficacy of imatinib in this setting for these tumors. Avapritinib is one of the agents, and we are also going to cover that in a few minutes. This is a long-term act, uh, activity of imatinib in first-line setting, 400 versus 800 mg per day, and we can see that about 10 to 15% of the patients are still alive more than a decade after the initiation of treatment. And these were patients treated 20 years ago, probably the results right now are, are, are slightly, uh, slightly better. Actually, this is a treatment which is uh, procuring a very long-term survival for a minority of patients. So next line treatment may be useful as we are going to see. What is interesting also is that not all GIST, again, should receive exactly the same treatment. And these curves highlight the outcome of patients with exon 9 mutations who are benefiting from the dose escalation up to 800 of imatinib in terms of improvement of progression-free survival, as we can see on the left panel. Other subtypes of GIST may require slightly, a slightly adapted treatment as well, and we are going to see that again with the E842V uh, mutation in a few minutes. When we start the imatinib in advanced phase, we should not interrupt imatinib because if we stop treatment at one year, 
at three years or at five years. This is associated with a relapse for the majority of patients at the median duration of six to 12 months. Of course, patients uh, respond again if you reintroduce the treatment, but you most of the time do not reach again the same level of response that you have before a treatment interruption. So treatment should be continued when the patients are sensitive, at least in the first five years, and uh, exploration on uh, interruption at later times are still ongoing. If patient has progressed and demonstrated progression under imatinib, a second line treatment has been demonstrated to be active. This is sunitinib, which pro uh, procured improved progression-free and overall survival in this randomized pivotal trial, which led to the registration of this agent. There are different uh, uh, modes of delivery of uh, sunitinib, which you can give four weeks on, two weeks off, or continuous treatment with a slightly lower dose. Uh, this trial was performed with a four weeks on, two weeks off uh, um, uh, posology of the treatment. If the patient is progressing, or when the patient is progressing under sunitinib, then the third line treatment is based on regorafenib, which is uh, given at a dose of 460 mg per day, three weeks on, one week off, with an improvement in progression-free survival in this randomized pivotal trial, which led to the registration of this agent. But we have to remember that some uh, GIST do not respond at all to this classical treatment, and PDGF receptor alpha mutant GIST are, for the majority of them, uh, mutations on exon 18. And for this, those patients with exon 18 D842V mutation, there is basically a median progression-free survival of, uh, uh, with imatinib and sunitinib, which is very close to two months, with a, long -term, uh, with a low overall survival, which is at a median of 12 months. So we need new treatment for this molecular subset of GIST, which are not responding very well to the classical treatment that we have. We may use as well uh, a surgery to uh, remove uh, a disease remaining under uh, first-line imatinib treatment. Actually, we tried to randomize this question of using uh, a surgery to try to remove uh, all the lesions in advanced phase. This trial failed to accrue sufficient number of patients, but this interesting uh, randomized clinical trial, which did not reach its, uh, its full inclusion, also provided some indication that there may be a trend for an improved uh, long-term outcome with a patient being uh, operated. But this is not proven so far, so surgery remains relatively exceptional for the treatment of this patient being proposed to 5-10% to of the patients, probably no more. Finally, how can we improve first-line treatment uh, attempts in the absence of uh, uh, new treatment uh, and considering the uh, side effect profile of the different agents, I tend to rotate the treatments which are available, in this case imatinib and regorafenib, where explored in a randomized setting, the ALT-GIST study has been completed and the outcome has been uh, reported for the first observation period, uh, which, uh, will, uh, which actually did show uh, no significant improvement in progression-free survival with a strategy of rotation. But we need to wait more for the maturation of this data. All right, so in conclusion for this first uh, masterclass, we can conclude that uh, molecular characterization is important for the management of GIST because this is a, a disease which gathers a wide variety of different diseases with completely different natural history and response to, to, uh, to treatment. Treatment options in advanced GIST are a systemic treatments and surgery is rarely proposed. The standard treatments are uh, somewhat uh, 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 limited, and we, have, we are going to see we have, uh, that we have now new treatment options which uh, could help us to treat better those patients with advanced disease. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Blay. That was terrific. We have a few questions coming in, so let's see. Um, let's start with this one. You talked a little bit about surgery for the management of patients who have uh, received imatinib, but what do you do with patients who maybe um, are progressing somewhat on sunitinib or ragorafenib? Do you also offer them surgery? 
Well, we tend to have the same um, unfrequent indication for surgery, which is typically uh, an equivocal progression with one progressive site while the others are still being controlled. In this case, in particular, if we have a suspicion that the lesion may be uh, a progressive lesion while the others are uh, not progressing, and if we have a, a suffi sufficient previous duration of treatment, we may want to remove a progressive site. Um, this happens relatively rarely. I, should, I would say even rarer than with uh, imatinib, probably in less than 5% of the patients. Are there different considerations uh, for surgery when you're, a patient has been on sunitinib or regorafenib, Dr. George? Uh, no, that's a really good question. Both sunitinib and regorafenib have VEGF inhibition as part of their inhibitory profile. And so their, the risk of wound healing complications is uh, perhaps slightly higher than it would be for imatinib. We do still perform surgery at times, as Dr. Blay said, in, in very selected cases, but we ensure that patients have been off drug for several days before going into surgery, and then we make sure that the wound is beginning to heal uh, before we would consider resumption. And that's a decision we often time together closely with our surgeons. Terrific. Um, here's another interesting one that I uh, think is important. Um, when somebody is progressing on a matinib, do you go ahead and rebiopsy these patients? What do you see as the role of rebiopsy? Dr. Play? Well, we do not routinely rebiopsy the patient. We uh, do that often in the case of clinical trial, but this is, of course, not routine. We also do that when we are uncertain uh, on the nature of a new lesion, where uh, the, the lesion has been there for a period of time and it was not progressing and suddenly it is progressing. In this case, we may rebiopsy. I would say that we rebiopsy in routine setting probably one third of the patient, no more than that. And Dr. George, do you always find GIST? You know, that's an interesting question. So occasionally we find something different. Um, we've had several patients over the years that have actually developed a desmoid, um, particularly in the mesentery. And I think that when something is not behaving as one would expect, um, it is important to consider uh, that whether there may be an alternative diagnosis. Um, the, the issue with desmoids is, has often been um, the, un, the rare patient where you may have an, an isolated progression that we then go on to take to surgery, and then we may find an, an alternate um, pathology going on, an, al an alternate process. Great. Um, this is a question maybe not quite along the lines that, that we've been talking about, but for patients who have um, tumor rupture at the time of primary surgery. What are your considerations when you're thinking about these patients? Dr. Play? That, that's a complicated question and a very good question. I would say that uh, there are probably different types of rupture, but everyone agrees that the uh, rupture is associated with a substantially increased risk of relapse. So in what we call severe rupture, uh, we would consider them mostly as a patient with metastatic disease without detectable or measurable lesions. There are ruptures which are probably more benign, where we may uh, want to propose a, a, a treatment which is of a longer duration in the adjuvant setting. In general, this is a, a something which is affecting the, the, next line, the, the next treatment and the medical treatment we are giving the patient afterwards. Yes, they are challenging patients. Great. Um, well, I think we're out of questions, and so let's move on to masterclass number two, Dr. George. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Von Maren. So today I'll be discussing um, a new wave of modern tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the management of advanced GIST and how we think about integrating these into our treatment. So in 2020, there have been two new kinase inhibitors approved for advanced GIST. 
Repretinib, which is a broad spectrum kit inhibitor, which is approved in the fourth line and beyond setting, and avapritinib, which is a highly targeted narrow spectrum inhibitor with specific potency against kit exon 17, as well as PDGF receptor alpha um, exon 18, including D842V. Avapritinib was approved for just harboring this unique mutation, which has been previously undruggable. Repretinib is a kit direct switch pocket inhibitor. Compared to type 1 or classical type 2 kinase inhibitors, kit switch pocket inhibitor repretinib binds potently and durably to kit and Peter Jeff receptor alpha. And in doing so, it, it binds not only the switch pocket but also the activation loop, essentially forcing the kit uh, sort of kit into its inactive state. And in doing so, preclinical data have suggested that this um, that this basically inhibits virtually all mutant forms of kit in preclinical models. Repretinib was evaluated in a phase one study, uh, which showed significant activity in advanced GIST and then was rapidly transitioned into a pivotal phase three trial known as the Invictus trial. In Invictus, patients with previously treated advanced or metastatic GIST who had received three or four or more therapies were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to receive repretinib 150 milligrams once a day or placebo. Patients were stratified by the number of prior therapies, three versus greater than or equal to four, performance status of zero versus performance status of one or two. There were a total of 129 patients enrolled with a primary outcome of progression-free survival and secondary outcomes of objective response rate, time to tumor progression, overall survival, quality of life, and disease control rates. This table summarizes the patient characteristics enrolled in the phase three Invictus trial. And as you can see, the arms were quite well balanced between the repretinib and placebo arms. And the overall demographic of the population is reflective of what would be expected in a group of patients with advanced GIST, with the median age of 60 years old, a relatively, relatively even balance of uh, male-female with a slight male predominance. <clears throat> the majority of patients had a performance status of one or two, and um, again, per study design, um, two thirds of the patients, roughly just over 60% had had three prior therapies. So the enrollment in this study was fourth line with the remainder having received already at least four lines. When looking at the primary driver mutation of the tumor, the majority of patients had a primary kit exon 11 mutation, which again is what we would expect in a general population of patients with advanced GIST. This slide summary summarizes the progression-free survival of the uh, from the phase one. I'm sorry, the phase three Invictus trial, and there was a significant difference within a, uh, of repretinib PFS compared to placebo, with repretinib at 6.3 months compared to, compared to placebo at one month, a hazard ratio of 0.15 and a significantly signif statistically significant p-value. When looking at sub-PFS by subgroup analysis, nearly all subgroups favored repretinib. And the subgroups that actually crossed one had very low um, numbers, and I think the statistical power there was quite limited. So the repretinib really benefited across, across subgroups. The overall survival for the placebo cohort was at 6.3 months. And again, because the outer, the outer edge of the confidence interval has not yet been met with further follow-up, um, we'll have to see where the repretinib uh, cohort uh, finally matures. So repretinib, based on these very exciting uh, results from Invictus, uh, repretinib is a new option as fourth-line treatment for patients with GIST, um, independent of mutation status. 
This slide summarizes the response data seen in Invictus, as has been seen in other pivotal studies of kinase inhibitors in GIST. The confirmed overall response rate is relatively modest uh, at, uh, at 9%. Um, but the stable disease or disease control rate at 12 weeks approached 50%. The safety of Invictus uh, is, is shown here. And I think what's really striking about Repretinib is overall, it's a very well tolerated drug. It does have some unique side effects that we don't typically see with other uh, kinase inhibitors that we use in GIST. And this is particularly notable for alopecia. But I would note that there were no grade three alopecias and it was primarily uh, grade one or two. And because of the encouraging results of repretinib in, um, in, the, in, in the Invictus trial leading to the approval, repretinib is now being looked at in earlier lines of therapy with an ongoing phase three trial known as Intrigue, which is randomizing patients following progression on imatinib in the first line or intolerant to imatinib in the first line. The randomization is one-to-one -one repretinib to sunitinib with the primary outcome of progression-free survival and secondary outcomes of overall response rate and overall survival. As has been mentioned in Dr. Blaze's talk, Peter Jeff Receptor Alpha D842V mutant gists are a challenge. It's highly they are highly resistant to current kinase inhibitors. Avapritinib is a highly selective kit in Peter Jeff receptor alpha inhibitor that was specifically designed to potently inhibit this mutation. And as you can see in this slide, um, <clears throat> avapritinib is um, highly active with a very meaningful IC50 in this particular mutation, as well as demonstrating activity in combined mutations with a primary 11, uh, exon 11 driver. The phase one navigator trial uh, is, is summarized here. This was a phase one first in human study of avapritinib, and it was intentionally designed to include patients with metastatic gist with a predefined intent to enroll patients with Peter Jeff receptor alpha mutant gist in order to evaluate early signs of efficacy in this uh, previously untreatable population. The study evaluate, um, patients were treated with avapritinib at a variety of doses to identify the recommended phase two dose. And there were predefined cohorts evaluating, as I mentioned earlier, Peter Jeff receptor alpha exon 18 mutant gist, which includes the D842V population, as well as patients in fourth line and beyond <clears throat> with kit mutations. The patient characteristics are summarized here. And similarly to the previous study that I shared, the population was quite reflective of a, um, what would be expected for an advanced GIST population. Patients with GIST harboring primary mutations in exon 18 of Peter Jeff receptor alpha had a dramatic have had dramatic responses to avapritinib, as is shown here in this waterfall plot, with all patients um, having uh, disease control and the and all except and all really having significant uh, disease uh, reduction. Um, with a uh, and, and based on this, actually, avapritinib was ultimately approved for patients who have metastatic GIST harboring Peter Jeff receptor alpha exon 18 mutations, including the D842V mutation, which we've been discussing. The safety data from Navigator is, is, is summarized here. Again, the majority of patients were able to stay on treatment. Um, that some of the side effects are similar to what has been seen with other kinase inhibitors, particularly anemia, fatigue, and some edema. In, uniquely though, um, avapritinib has been shown to have some cognitive effects in some patients, um, majority of these being grade one and two, but it is an important side effect to be aware of because early dose interruption and dose reduction can certainly mitigate those effects. 
Avapritinib was also evaluated, as I mentioned earlier, in Kit Mutant GIST. And from the phase one navigator trial, there was clear evidence in some patients of tumor reduction. And this led to a pivotal phase three trial known as Voyager, which compared avapritinib in the third and fourth line to regorafenib. This study has been presented at CTOS this year by Dr. Kang, um, showing those results. Unfortunately, the study did not meet its primary endpoint of improvement in progression-free survival, and there was no meaningful difference in PFS between avapritinib and regorafenib. There are additional emerging therapies uh, for advanced and metastatic GIST, um, cabazantinib, DS6157A and PLX9486 plus sunitinib have had updates at CTOS 2020. Additional co um, compounds of interest include crinolinib, which is um, being developed also in D842V mutant GIST, as well as nivolumab plus ipilimumab, which in a single arm study is being explored. And we look forward to having more mature data um, from that combination as well. So in conclusion, repretinib is a new option in the fourth line setting of advanced GIST. Ongoing studies are evaluating this novel compound in earlier settings of metastatic GIST. Avapritinib is a new option for patients with Peter Jeff receptor alpha mutant GIST with exon 18 mutations, which is extremely important in D842V patients, which was a previously untreatable and undruggable disease. Negative results have recently been reported in an uns mutationally unselected population of patients with advanced kit mutant GIST. Several emerging agents and combination strategies are being studied and we'll look forward to seeing those results as the data mature. Thank you for having me uh, have the opportunity to share these results and Dr. Von Maren, I will turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Dr. George. That was a great summary of uh, the exciting data that we've been privy to this year. So, so let's talk about um, some of the, review some of the questions that are coming in. Um, you talked about um, alopecia from repretinib. So what do you do for patients? Is there a magic cure? What, what kind of things can, do patients do? Well, I think it's really important to educate patients about, the, about it. It is somewhat of a different toxicity than we see in other um, GIST agents. Um, most of the time, it's thinning. Occasionally, it can be more significant thinning, but I think preparing people and letting them know that this is a potential risk is important. I know that I've seen in some of my patients not only thinning, but sometimes a change in the character of their hair, a little mm -hmm. bit curlier too. So it is, I, I agree with you, education is uh, the best approach. Dr. Blay, do you have thoughts about sequencing these agents, repretinib and avapritinib? I, I, I think, as it has been said, that avapritinib has a, has a very selective activity on the, these D842V mutations. So uh, that would be probably the best uh, first-line treatment to propose to these specific patients. Otherwise, with repretinib, we tend to follow what is the conclusion of the uh, Invictus study, which is to propose repretinib in a fourth line setting uh, after progression and uh, uh, regorafenib. And while earlier studies are investigating repretinib in an earlier setting, and then at the time of uh, uh, progression of uh, under repretinib, we tend to propose avapretinib, whatever feasible for this patient uh, within the context of a clinical trial or, or, or a, a compassionate use program. So avapretinib after repretinib in this case. Terrific. Um... You know, we've talked a little bit, or Dr. Uh, George presented the data on cognitive side effects. How do you assess patients for this? You know, I think that similar to alopecia in many ways, it starts with education and making sure that patients and their families are aware that this is a potential side effect of avapritinib. Um, in, the, in, in practice, it tends to present itself often as short-term memory changes, um, often, you know, not remembering where you put the keys or forgetting that someone may have just asked you, you just answered a question. And I think making both the patient and the family members aware of this and asking them and making sure that they know to report in if they've noticed a change in that pattern of, of, of often short-term memory is very, very important. 
Great. Another question that came in, uh, which is an interesting one, is um, what's your perspective on circulating tumor DNA? Dr. Blay? Well, uh, circulating tumor DNA is certainly a, a very fascinating technology to uh, evidence uh, resistant mutations in, in vivo in, in patients without having a biopsy. Uh, and, and that's certainly something which is not yet routine, but being more and more used when you, when, when you want to document better what is a molecular ca characteristic of a patient who is progressing. And, um, uh, and the fact that it's becoming uh, more and more feasible and, the, I, I would say, more sensitive to detect uh, resistant mutation uh, shows that probably in the near future this will be a, a, a technology used quite frequently to monitor patients. Great. All right. I think we can move on. And let's go to our practicum practical aspects of applying modern TKIs in the clinic. So let's revisit with our patient. Recall he is a 64-year-old gentleman with metastatic gist who has a KIT exon 11 mutation who was started on imatinib um, with a good response and then developed progression um, at two years. So he's showing signs of resistance. And in the literature, you can find information about primary versus secondary re resistance. Dr. George, what do you consider to be primary resistance? We often will think of primary resistance as disease progression within the first three to six months of imatinib. And that typically implies that there's an underlying driver mutation that is not imatinib sensitive. So either a primary D842V mutation, impeter Jeff receptor alpha, as we've discussed, um, possibly no activating mutation, so what may be considered you know, wild-type GIST or wild-type Peter Jeff receptor alpha, so some other driver um, such as NF1 or um, an SDH-deficient GIST patient, um, or even at times a, an exon 9 mutation, which as Dr. Blay had mentioned earlier, tends to be more sensitive to higher dose imatinib than 400 milligrams. So we tend to think of it as tumors that never respond, that tend to have progression within the first six months, and that may be therefore reflective of an underlying imatinib insensitive primary driver mutation. And I think certainly um, one way we could avoid that is actually checking to see what the mutation is. And I think especially now that we have more agents that um, can uh, particularly target things like d 842 v we want to be thinking about the role of upfront mutation when we're starting therapy on patients. So um, secondary um, resistance is really when the patient has been on treatment for more than six months, as Dr. George mentioned, um, and really suggests the development of clones with secondary mutations. So when you're faced with a patient like this, Dr. Blay, what are your thoughts um, about how to approach um, the patient um, during that first encounter with a scan that shows progression? Well, I, I think what is, what is really important, the first thing when I, uh, I do when I see a patient progressing is to confirm the progression. And, and to confirm the progression is due to uh, resistance and not to uh, a problem of compliance to the treatment. Uh, so we usually, usually do not uh, hurry very much to switch the treatment. I think interrogating the patient on whether he or she has taken carefully the medication in the past weeks and months is extremely important. And sometimes you discover that the patients are not very reliable in taking the drug every day. Uh, another difficult aspect is, uh, uh, is the, um, the, the question of uh, equivocal progression for some lesions. Most of the patients with secondary resistance present with uh, um, lesions which are progressing while other lesions are stable. And to, to demonstrate fully the progression on a, on a, on a partial progressive lesion, uh, as we call them, is something somewhat, uh, somewhat difficult. So we really have to confirm, and to confirm it relatively quickly because the patient may need a, a next line of treatment, but we have to be, to be sure. I would say that at least in our experience, a significant proportion of patients should first um, reapply uh, uh, um, uh, rigorously the treatment as it has been proposed because this is often some, a place where the patient do not fully um, uh, uh, follow the, 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 the rules of prescription of the drugs. 
How often do you suggest increasing the dose of imatinib, Dr. George? So certainly if somebody has a primary exon 9 mutation, then I would increase the dose. Um, it's not as clear to me from the data that in exon 11 mutant patients that dose escalation provides a significant benefit. Occasionally I will do it and it certainly is a consideration in many of the guidelines, um, but the, the benefit of dose escalation is usually rather modest in terms of the overall uh, time to next progression. Um, so certainly it can be considered, um, but I do anticipate anticipate following those patients very closely if I do choose to go that route. I find similar. And then, you know, certainly if there is sort of an isolated progression, as Dr. Blay mentioned earlier, discussing the patient with your surgeon, your surgical colleagues, and seeing is there a role um, for potentially a resection of a, a progressing mutation makes sense as well. Um, but if all of those things have been, you know, reviewed, um, there's uh, compliance is good in the patient. They don't really have an exon 9 mutation. Um, oftentimes, uh, if they're not a surgical candidate, changing the therapy is the next best step. So to think about recommendations in the fourth line setting, um, now we know that repretinib is now uh, approved. Um, and Dr. Uh, Professor Gel uh, Gelderblum updated uh, the results from the Invicta study. Um, and what was quite um, uh, exciting about this update was uh, with an additional nine months of follow-up, um, we still have not met the median overall survival in the patients who um, were started on repretinib. And I think that's really very exciting um, for patients. Um, the response rate um, in this um, update was slightly higher, went up to 11.8%, um, and uh, there were no new safety findings. And so really, um, repretinib is showing itself to be a well-tolerated drug um, that uh, appears to be uh, providing long-term disease control for patients um, and improving their uh, survival. Dr. George, I'm going to ask you to, to discuss this um, abstract um, that you presented earlier today on dose escalation of repretinib. So we just presented this updated uh, data at CTOS that was originally presented at ESMO that was evaluating the dose escalation of repretinib in the phase one trial um, of repretinib. So the way the study was designed is that for patients who started repretinib at 150 milligrams once a day, at the time of disease progression per local review, patients had the opportunity to dose escalate to 150 milligrams twice a day. There were a total of 100, 142 patients that were enrolled in the study at 150 milligrams daily, and of them, of that 142 patients, 67 underwent interpatient dose escalation to 150 milligrams BID. The efficacy endpoints that were evaluated were PFS1, defined, defined as progression-free survival on repretinib at 150 milligrams once per day, cycle one, day one to progression, and PFS2, which was progression-free survival on a repretinib 150 milligrams twice a day, defined as the date of intrapatient dose escalation to progression or death. All patients with radio, radio, radiologic progression had the option to dose escalate, and the data cutoff that we used for this analysis was May 2020. These are the um, Kaplan-Meier curves of both PFS1 as well as PFS2 by line of therapy. And I think what's really interesting to note is that the, in the PFS1, the median PFS for the fourth line was 5.5 months, 8.3 months for third line, and 11 months for second line. Important to note that the confidence intervals for second and third line were relatively broad because of the, the smaller cohort size, but the fourth line and beyond cohort with a median PFS of, of just under six months is pretty consistent what, what, with what has been seen with this agent at 150 milligrams once a day. 
When dose escalating to 150 milligrams twice per day, the median PFS2 is similar across lines of therapy at about four to, around four to five months, um, slightly lower for third line, again, smaller cohort. But it really suggests that patients who remain on repretinib after dose escalation continue to have disease uh, disease control, at least measured in some number of months. I think this is also a testament to the generally well-tolerated nature of the drug as patients continue to remain on um, in, in, in a time that's, that's somewhat similar to um, their PFS1 during PFS2 at twice the dose. poster that, uh, excuse me, a paper that was presented by Dr. Bauer earlier today talked about the heterogeneity of KIT and BGFR alpha mutations in the Invictus study. Um, and what was interesting in um, this study uh, was that there did not appear to be significant differences in who responded. The types of patients who were present in the study were um, akin to what we would think of an advanced disease population, largely patients with exon 11 and exon 9 mutations. Um, but this poster also, uh, paper also talked about the um, circulating tumor DNA um, and very nicely demonstrated that looking at uh, blood, you can find different mutations and secondary mutations or what we think of as resistance mutations by sampling the blood, um, oftentimes more than what were seen in any biopsies that may have been done um, at the time um, sort of concurrently. So again, speaking to what Dr. Blay mentioned earlier, this idea that uh, using the blood to look at circulating tumor DNA may in the future be a may be a much better way of thinking about what are what's in this tumor and making decisions about how we might target it the best. In addition, uh, Dr. Patrick Shofsky had a, a poster that looked at repretinib activity across the different um, mutations. Um, but uh, to <clears throat> excuse me, highlight you know, what's been seen in in vitro experiments, repretinib is really quite sensitive against multiple resistance mutations at quite low IC50s. If you look at the, compared to a matinib or sunitinib, um, the shorter the bar, the lower the dose that is required. And you can see repretinib is really quite sensitive um, in inhibiting the growth of pay, of multiple um, resistance mutations. So when we're thinking about patients in fourth line, um, what do we think about reintroducing imatinib? There have been studies evaluating that. Where do you see that fitting in now that we have these other agents? Dr. Blay? Well, I think reintroducing imatinib, what, what, what was we used to do in the past, but now uh, having the results of uh, repretinib with a median progression-free survival uh, uh, close to six months and a very long overall survival. So for some patients, we are far much better than what we had in the pivotal trial reported by Dr. Kang on imatinib versus uh, placebo in this setting. So I think Right now, imatinib as a rule, but possibly, but later in uh, patients who have exhausted all other options, and we should do repretinib first, and this is what we try to do. There certainly are multiple small studies that have been published, um, and some larger ones, looking at other agents such as serafinib or nilotinib, um, pazopinib, um, looking at a tyrosine kinase inhibitor with everolimus. How do you think about those other drugs in the setting of um, advanced GIST, especially with these new agents? Dr. George? You know, most of the studies that evaluated these agents did so before, um, certainly before repretinib was available, and some of these studies came before regorafenib was available. So, you know, I, from, from my perspective, I right now we have you know, we have imatinib, we have sunitinib, we have regorafenib, we have repretinib. And I really stayed with those sort of as my first four lines um, based on the current approvals. I think 
post repretinib progression, um, I do think that the dose escalation data is very interesting. Um, it's a very well tolerated compound and the PFS2 on, on dose escalated repretinib is actually somewhat similar to the PFSs that were reported in many of these small studies. Um, so although that these are useful under certain circumstances, I would have to say that with the availability of the newer um, agents, I, I'm using them less than I had in the past. And what about dasatinib, Dr. Blay? There's some data out there or reports that it may have some activity in PGFR-alpha D842V. Yeah, this is one of the agents that we try to use occasionally for these rare patients. But right now, I would say that we have some other interesting agents for the 842V patients. And we, we've mentioned, of course, avapretinib, repretinib as well. And also we have the trial that was mentioned a few minutes ago on, with, with crenolanib. So we have a um, kind of a plethora of options for these uh, very rare patients. And dazatinib is less well used than what we used to do in this rare patient population, I, I think. It's nice to be able to have so many options. Mm. So for these patients at this point, offering avapritinib, even in the first line setting in metastatic disease is very appropriate. When I talk to my patients about avapritinib and its toxicities, I try and compare it to side effects that we see more frequently with imatinib. We do see more fluid retention. Patients oftentimes will have periorbital edema or even facial edema, as well as peripheral edema. They tend to have anemia as well, but we don't see hand-foot syndrome. Uh, and for many patients, that's a blessing because that can be a difficult toxicity to uh, take care of. We've talked about the neurologic toxicity, which is really um, something to educate your patients well. Certainly most patients have mild symptoms, but there have been some rare severe uh, issues and so it's really important to be cognizant and educate your patients. There have been rare cases of bleeding in the brain. Uh, again, very, very rare, but important, to, again, to educate your patients. We've talked a little bit about what we do for patients who have progressed upon first-line avapritinib. And Dr. Blay, you mentioned um, repretinib. Uh, how robust is the data for repretinib in patients who have received, uh, who have D8, uh, excuse me, who have PGFR alpha mutations? Well, uh, a subgroup of patients has been included in the phase one and in the, and in the Invictus study. It's not a large group of patients. So there are uh, some evidence that some patients derive an important benefit from, uh, from this treatment. Uh, I must say that the uh, evidence for patients after avapritinib is probably not, not very strong, but there, there are signs of activity uh, for, for this patient population, which needs to be further studied, I would call. Yes, I know certainly the two studies, the two drugs were being developed at the same time. And yeah. I personally have a sense that many patients who had D842V ended up seeking out studies with avapritinib because of the exciting activity that was being seen. Uh, so I do, in my worldview, I sort of feel like we need more information. Dr. George, what are your impressions of that data? Yeah, no, I agree. I think that there, the number of Peter Jeff receptor alpha patients included in the repretinib studies was, was very small. I think that the preclinical data that suggests very um, broad spectrum activity of repretinib um, is certainly intriguing, um, but the, the number of patients is quite limited. And I think it's exactly for the reasons that you said, um, that avapritinib was just becoming available and the um, activity is so dramatic in this patient population. I suspect that over time, we'll start to see more um, need to try alternative agents, um, and then we, we may be able to gather that data. Yeah. So I want to thank all of you for your attention, Dr. Blay, Dr. George, for your participation today. Uh, to conclude, we've talked about the treatment of GIST and really focused on uh, 
the data that shows that GIST is no longer a one-size-fits-all type of disease. Multidisciplinary care is important, and it's important also to personalize treatments for patients with GIST, particularly with understanding what the, the molecular driver of each individual patient's tumor is. And in 2020, we've had some very exciting data, um, which led to the approval of two new treatment options, repretinib and avapritinib, and we hope that there will be more on the horizon. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash MER860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Decipher Pharmaceuticals.